Hi guys and welcome back to today's interview in a Girl Talks Formula One with you, Manana Manotu, and today I'm gonna start things a little bit differently. Instead of giving you the whole description, I'm just straight out gonna tell you which driver I am interviewing today. We have a W Series racing driver, Kila Agarin, with us today. Whether she's winning the F1600 championship, spotting for IndyCar, or even driving as a safety car, Ayla Agren has done it all. She started racing at only six years old and today she tells her whole journey. But don't hear it from me. Let's hear it from her. Ready for the interview? In three, two, one. Hi guys and welcome back to A Girl Talks Formula One. Thank you all for joining once again to this week's podcast. And today I have one of the most special guests. Ever. She is a driver from W Series who actually has a dual nationality. See, she's actually Swedish and Norwegian. So welcome here, Ayla Agren. Hi, Ayla. How are you doing? Welcome Good, thanks. How are you? Thank you for having me. Of course. It's such a pleasure to have you here. So I wanted to ask you, first things first, of course, how do you get started in racing? Uh, it was all through my uncle and, and cousin. We were close by my grandparents' place. They were doing the Nordic Championship in karting and we went to go cheer on them. And it was all really exciting, but I didn't really see any girls. And then all of a sudden, sudden I spotted a, a female carter and, and that's when kind of the light switch went, went on. And I was six years old at the time. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to do this. Like, this is, I would love to do this. And then kept asking my parents over and over and right. kind of one thing led to another. And then now 20 years plus here we are. <laughs> that is so exciting. But when did you actually start racing? Was it at six years old? Yeah. I, so I took my license that fall. And then in Norway, where I grew up over the winters, we can't can't race because of all the the snow and and how cold it is but then that spring so the spring i was gonna turn seven is is the year i started oh that's so nice you started so young because yeah. it's so interesting <laughs> girls normally tend to start a bit older because precisely about what you said they don't see many girls in the sport well it's growing nowadays but it used to be more of a men's world let's say so it's so nice that you started so young i was lucky being at the right place at the at the right time seeing it and kind of getting that aha moment of, of understanding that it was something that was possible for for girls to do as well and right. super lucky to have have my parents supporting it a hundred percent and you moved so young to the u.s right to pursue your career as a driver yes uh that's correct i moved over uh when i turned 18 finished my high school degree i wow. went to graduation packed my bags and left <laughs> the next day for for my first race at Road America with Skip Barber at that time. You were so young because I'm from Mexico and normally what we do is that whenever we finish high school, we either go a year abroad or we probably move to another city in our same country so that we can, I don't know, go to university. But you moving to across the ocean, that must have been so scary. How did you feel at the moment? It was all very exciting. I was obviously lucky. I had a really good port personnel around me and, yeah. and teammates and, and like it became, became a family racing family. And with that being said, it was always just positive and exciting for sure. There's times you missed family. And I remember, especially because I moved so young, I had issues with rental cars and stuff like that <laughs> while traveling. There was one day I was on my way from Florida to Monterey uh, in California okay. where Laguna Seca is and all these flight delays and cancellations and my ride to the track uh, they had, had to leave and i call my mom and i'm like what do i do and she's like <laughs> well, it's the middle of the night here like there's not much i can do you just gotta figure it out and no. i was lucky to to see one someone from the series at the airport and it all worked out but it's those are the moments when you realize how far away you are <laughs> I know it's so scary but I wanted to ask you I mean I know you're European and Europeans normally know a lot of languages since they're very young but your accent is so perfect and it's an American accent I mean I know you've been living there for a while but not as long to have this type of accent that you have it's impressive well thank you no it's my, my family makes fun of me for it because I have a lot of <laughs> 
a lot of British family and they make fun right. of the American accent. So, it, <laughs> so it's, uh, so it's a little funny, but no, it, I've, I really embraced living in the U S and, um, I guess the accent came with it. <laughs> and you've been living there ever since you moved to pursue your career. Pretty much. Yes. I, I still went to college or university in, in Norway and, and I worked really well with, with them. I flew back and forth for exams for a little bit there, but living wise, I, I've been in the U S ever since. Yes. That is so crazy, but congratulations. I mean, you're so multifaceted and that's precisely a little bit about what I want to talk about with you today. You've been yes, in the racing environment, but through so many different stages, so let's start first with 2014 when you actually won the championship for the F1600. That was on your second season on the category, right? Not so long after you moved to the US. Yes, that's correct. And that's by far my my biggest highlight and, and moment, I guess, of uh, finally clinching the championship and there was were there were good moments the first season, but the second season it all really came together and, and yeah we, we did really really well. That is so exciting and such a great achievement because you were also so young, and then a little bit later after that you moved to IndyCar and correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually went through several stages, right? You started as a driver, then you became a spotter and eventually you became a safety car driver. Is that correct? I've done very many different things for the <laughs> race. Yes, so. Um, after 1600, I went through the stages of US after thousand and, and did some testing and such in, in Indy Pro and, and the road to Indy or Mazda road to Indy, which is was called back then. And then with some challenges financially and budgets for racing that didn't work out. Um, I then started spotting, um, both in road to Indy and IndyCar. Um, and now I'm, I'm doing the, the pace cars for, for IndyCar during their events and, and weekends for for both guests and safety and and no it's uh it's been a journey that's so exciting because i had never really heard about a woman being a safety car driver that for me was mega exciting because once again you're breaking the stigma and that's something that i try to do on this podcast all the time you know breaking the stigma that this world is not only for men that women can get involved in it too absolutely it's as as long as you're you're willing to to work hard and work hard for it you you can figure it out anywhere a hundred percent and that is what I find makes you such an inspiration to other women. I mean, I have been following your career for quite a while. I have always admired you so much because of your versatility. This is something that I find so important, especially to try out in different parts of life. So out of all the categories or all the types of cars that you've driven, which one do you find the most challenging? I mean, driving in itself is, is challenging no matter what, right? Because you're- I'm a terrible you're, driver, so I know. Always, always, and it's it's such small margins. It's not like we're talking about a second corner. It's all fine, fine, fine detail. So so that in itself is, is challenging and, and a thrill because like as soon as you're nipping a little bit at a time, you, you keep progressing. But aside from that, I really enjoy the spotting as well. It's it's one of the things where you're you're still very very much involved in the driving side. You're not in the car, but you're still a very much part of it. Um, so that to me, from being on the outside of the car, that is is one of the things I really enjoy. Of course, and I actually had a female guest that's also a spotter, but she's in NASCAR Mexico, and well, the interview was in Spanish, so she explained a little bit about what spotters do. Yep. If I'm honest with you, I didn't even know IndyCar had spotters, so if you can please explain to us, to the people listening, what a spotter does, because it is something very challenging as you mentioned it's and it's quite specific and a lot of it is the relationship you form with the driver yeah uh, the trust and and basically what we do is you're a second pair of eyes you're a pair of eyes in the sky for the driver and you're explaining anything from um safety aspects of if there's been a wreck and if there's debris on track and and that part of it but more so you're a part of planning the race in, right. in a way where um, the drivers can't always see what's going on. A couple of cars ahead of them or a couple of cars behind them, or if someone's coming up quite a bit faster, especially on the ovals, you'll see that if you get a good draft and, and that part of it, if 
how far back they are, how fast they're closing, yeah. um, if there's one car coming, several cars coming. But at the end of the day, it's it's more so for, for safety, but the bigger and better the bond you create with your driver, the more you're able to to help them out on, on their racing part of it as well. Yeah, because besides being like the eyes of the driver, in a way you're like that little voice inside their head that they can't turn off. So yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Who do you spot or do you spot several different drivers? So it's been several different uh, throughout okay. the years. But uh, last year I worked with the Pareta Autosport, which was uh, oh. a female owned IndyCar team, a female driver <laughs> with Simona De Silvestro and and that was a really, really cool experience with, with uh, a lot of the engineers and the uh, mechanics, also females were trying to, trying to get more, more females involved in, in racing and, and IndyCar. A hundred percent. And you actually said the keyword for me to move on to the next topic. I mean, as we already mentioned throughout the interview, uh, you know, women getting into motorsports and then comes W series. A category created especially for women. There hasn't been many seasons due to COVID. There's been two seasons. And you tried applying was actually on 2020 and you got the pass, but it was COVID. So you had to wait until 2021. What does it feel like to race in a category that is only for women? It's been a very, very positive experience for me. When people first started talking about it, it was like, hmm. I like, I like racing against the guys and, and I still do. I, I love racing as a whole. It doesn't matter who you're competing against. I, I always want to just perform my best no matter who, who and what it is. But as a whole, it's been a really cool environment to be in. And I was a little scared when it became the talk. So I'm like, oh, I really hope it becomes something positive and not a cattiness, which could right. easily have been the thing with as many girls together and competing and, and all of that, but it's been a, yeah, like I said, super positive and it sounds like Empowering, I'm repairing, right? but, but that's what it's been and everyone's helping each out in, in different ways. So if it's yeah. just talking to each other, sharing um, how you, mm -hmm. you do different things of driving or preparations and no, it's been a very open environment, which is surprised me in a, in, in a good way. And that's something that I love about what you're saying. Shamefully, us women are known to be a little bit cattier and more competitive against each other than men are. Yep. And it's just, I find the W Series being all the drivers, such great role models, because it's such an empowering category that despite all of you competing against each other, obviously, because somebody wants to win, right? In a way, you all empower each other and you all support each other. And you've made it so special and so important that in such little time, it has become such a big category. I mean, I dare to say it's even as big almost as Formula One in a way, because I mean, it's been what, two years that it's been on the line. And everybody that's into motorsports, knows what W series is now. I'm yeah. so impressed with that. Like so impressed. And what is your favorite circuit for racing in W series? In W series, I would say trying to, I really enjoyed Red Bull ring. I think oh, that was, nice. was one of my, my favorites there, but all time I would say mid Ohio is my favorite track. Well, that's cool. What makes it so special for you? How technical it is and really, <laughs> really find the, the flow and ebb of it is, is what I really enjoy about it. And out of the new tracks, because W Series is growing a lot this season, thanks to its partnership with Formula One. Which yep. one are you the most excited about racing at? I would say Miami is is one that I'm very <laughs> intrigued to, as many, I think, to see how they've laid it all out and how it's going to work with a as a new circuit and I'm sure there will be challenges in, in different ways than what we're used to but that's an event I'm very much looking forward to yeah especially because it's going to be like a stadium inside a stadium and the party is going to be great do you guys get to party after races or during races not not much no it's uh, definitely not during and it's not much <laughs> after either because we're all so on the go and and right. preparing for the next one but hopefully when things ease up with with covid we can, can maybe have a end of the year party 
Oh, but definitely. Now, no, it's, it's pretty relaxed. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what it is like on a weekend at W Series. Like ever since you arrived to the city up to the time that you leave. Do you do a little touring? Tell us a little bit about this whole experience. So this past season in 2021, there was very strict still with COVID and and the way we we dealt with this was when we got to the airport, we were paired up with uh, what we called a bubble buddy. And uh, it was the one, your one friend, your one other driver that you were allowed to spend time with right. uh, and have dinners with and such, and which made it, harder to meet up as groups and stuff like that so everything you did you did with this person another driver so you got there went to the hotel um i tried to get in a day or so earlier because i was i'm still flying back and forth from houston to all of the european rounds and then it's to the track and you're you're there early in the mornings preparing going over as much onboard and data as you can we do the track walks we have media obligations and then it's straight into it friday morning and you're it's practice and then we had usually the schedules were practice in the in the early or late mornings and then uh, qualifications later that evening and then uh, you do everything you can to prepare for the race on Saturday that's nice I mean it sounds really cool and I'm a little bit bummed because I'm all about empowering women and I got the opportunity to be a pit marshal uh, during Formula One and technically W Series was gonna come I think I was equally if not slightly more excited to see W Series <laughs> because it's such a new category and all about women. So I was like, oh my gosh, I was thrilled. And then they canceled it and I was so bummed. So I can't wait for next year to it get to the double series. Yeah, it was a very sad day when they told us, all of us were just super, super bummed. So hopefully we can make, up, make it up for you guys this season. A hundred percent. The energy is gonna be insane. I mean, you're going to see what Mexico is like if you've not come before during the Formula One weekend. It's going to be crazy, mind-blowing, literally. And <laughs> before we move on to a little bit about Formula One, you're in a really cool team. I mean, it's related to Forbes magazine and Forbes world. It was actually Miguel, the fourth generation of the Forbes family who created the team, right? Has this team been since the beginning in W Series? And how did you join this specific team? So the team structure in W Series mm -hmm. uh, came about in 2021. So okay. it wasn't around for the, the first season, but came aboard last season. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel was, was a part of it from the get-go. Unfortunately, with all the travel restrictions that were still in place right. last year, they weren't able to attend a lot of the races, but we did get to, to meet them and and um, and be with Miguel and, and the rest of the the Forbes crew at uh, circuit at the Americas at the last event of the year, Perfect. which was awesome. And to really show them what their support is about and where what happens with it. And it's uh, it was an honor to to finally to meet and greet and and show yeah. show him and uh, the cars and, and all of it. So it was a, a really really cool experience. I know, I bet. Really exciting. I mean, I don't know if you were in a Forbes before this, but for me, I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. It's really nice to see, you know, known brands over the world Absolutely. being a part of this category because it shows you that they believe in it. Absolutely. And uh, when when they started announcing the, the teams to us early early last year, we were all blown away by by the names and the the brands that the series is about and, and is showing their support to it. You probably already heard the news about Jenner Racing. What do you think about this? I feel that everybody is like 50-50. Some people find it a bit controversial. Other people find it so inspirational. But what is your take on this? I I think it's great. It, you know, it shows that it's support. It's uh, someone that wants to, is a pioneer and wants to, to be a mm -hmm. part of something new and uh, driving or making history, driving it forward. And, and to me, that's what it's all about is, yeah. is instead of, instead of kind of staying in the past and, and sticking with it is, is trying to evolve and, and make things better. 
A hundred percent. It shows a little bit about all the diversity and inclusivity that a W series represents. I wanted to ask you about Formula One, my previous guest. His name is Aldas. You might or may not know who he is, but he's a Formula One content creator. He worked with Bellachi. And he has a question for you. My question is, who do you think is the most underrated driver on the 2022 grid? 2022 grid. Underrated. It's hard because they're also really, really good and they're rated in their own ways. But I would say, I don't know if he's underrated, but he hasn't been on the radar in the same way as he was prior as Alonso. And just how, how... diverse of a driver he is and i think with the how the team evolves i think we're gonna see them do very well this year that is such a great response like i am honestly shocked i wasn't expecting that for me one of the most underrated drivers which is kind of now on the radar has been carlos Sainz. yeah he, he was like he's been my favorite driver him and max verstappen for quite a while but i feel that nobody really turned to look at him until his first season with ferrari and the way he just performed was just mind-blowing he just proved to the world what he's actually capable of absolutely and i 100 percent agree with that you think he has what it takes to become a world champion eventually i do and i think the fact that the way he is worked for so long I yeah. think is really starting to to pay off for him now and and I think that's that determination is is what's going to get him there in the end and I think that the future is bright for him definitely so much especially because he's so persistent and dedicated before we leave I have a few quick questions related to Formula One for you the most controversial question who did you think was going to win in 2021 Max or Lewis, honestly. (laughs) Yeah, I'm trying to like, because it was all, I was going back and forth on it. I would have thought that Lewis was going to win. Okay, nice, nice. I like that. And now that the liveries are being revealed, I mean, it's only Alfa Romeo, the one that's missing, which will be revealed on Sunday. Which one has been your favorite one so far? I really like the McLaren look this year. I think they've really evolved and and I love the fact that they're really merging um, on all platforms, uh, both F1, IndyCar, Formula, like it's really showcasing the the team as a whole. And and I really like seeing that. 100%, I have to agree with you. I mean, if I have to pick a favorite, I think it's Aston Martin because it is literally the design that I was expecting for last season with the neon highlights that for me was so incredible. But you're so right about McLaren. I feel it had such a strong aesthetic, kind of like Red Bull, you know? Red Bull has been basically the same since they joined Formula One. In McLaren, since they changed to the papaya orange, they have kind of remained the same. So seeing this little tweaks in their livery, kind of like a brighter orange, but like a lighter blue, I love the combination. I do too. We'll have to wait and see how fast McLaren is because it looks really fast. (laughs) <laughs> and I wanted to ask you your top three predictions for constructors and your top five for drivers. <laughs> oh, wow. I know. Uh, <laughs> that's hard. I mean, I'm going to go with Mercedes for sure. Mercedes, Alpine, and McLaren. That's so Red Bull. Bold. Put Red Bull in there as well. I'm going to say yeah, top exactly. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> I said a little bit, well, very not similar to yours. I said Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes. I don't know. Yep. We'll have to bet on it at the end of the season. <laughs> yeah. You got the most correct. And what about your top five drivers? That's even tougher, to be honest. Yeah, it is. Max, Lewis, Sainz. Wow. George and Alonso. That is mega bold, very different than mine, but that's the thing about this season. I mean, probably won't be as dramatic as 2021, but it'll definitely be equally exciting because there's so many new regulations that any driver or any team can win this season. So yeah, we'll just have to wait to see what happens. And to close up our podcast, this will probably be a bit of a controversial question for you. So you can definitely not answer it if you don't want to. But this is something with what I close my podcast 
always for me every single person has to tell me what their take is on this okay you know that W series was created to give women a category to be you know separated from men just like other sports yep or that it is a platform for women to eventually reach formula one before i answer that question i'm going <laughs> to give a little bit of a background when i first heard rumors about a series just for women i was not the most supportive about it and i was because i i like competing against men i think it's one of the few sports that it's it's possible to to do so with both genders and didn't see the necessity of of a segregated series but the more i heard about it the more they showcased the opportunities they yeah. wanted to provide and I, i spoke with several people and i even had uh, a driver and a good friend of mine uh stefan wilson reached out to me and he said you know what isla if they created a series for really tall drivers and stefan is really tall i wouldn't think twice about racing in it because it's a massive opportunity and go for it it's something about his words really stuck and and it is with that i'm saying that to me i believe that it was created for opportunities and a future platform yeah. for something more not just something that's there to just be there right i love your question and precisely there's so many ex formula 1 drivers like david coulthard amongst others that are so involved in the category that's what kind of always gave me hope but just like you at the beginning i was a little bit skeptical about this maybe not segregation but this in a way separation yeah but it's so nice to hear this response and so refreshing from a driver that is actually in the category because in a way you can put kind of like an end to all the rumors to all the skepticism to all the doubts so i think i'm going to have to start changing my question <laughs> at the end of the podcast but thank you so much for answering that and i loved your response it was like so well explained and this is something that i feel that everybody should take into account once again i want to congratulate you so much for this path that you are forging for younger girls or even women my age you know women like you are opening so many ways to women in motorsports in general and you really are such an inspiration i wish you the best of success in all of your career that all of your dreams come true and i want to thank you once again for joining the podcast it was so nice having you here thank you so much for having me and thank you for telling our stories of course and Thank you guys also so much for coming all the way to the end of the interview. I will be seeing you again in 2 weeks on another episode of Girl Talks Formula 1. See you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>